Chapter Twenty Nine of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conversion. If there is a state of mind utterly forlorn, it is that in which we left the poor prisoner after Polemo had departed. She was neither a Christian nor was she not. She was in the midway region of inquiry, which as surely takes time to pass over except there be some almost miraculous interference as it takes time to walk from place to place you see a person coming towards you and you say impatiently why don't you come faster why are you not here already why because it takes time to see that heathenism is false to see that christianity is true are two acts and involve two processes they may indeed be united, and the truth may supplant the error, but they may not. Callista obeyed as far as truth was brought home to her. She saw the vanity of idols before she had faith in him who came to destroy them. She could safely say, I discard Jupiter. She could not say, I am a Christian. Besides, what did she know of Christians? how did she know that they would admit her if she wished it they were a secret society with an election an initiation and oaths not a mere philosophical school or a profession of opinion open to any individual if they were the good people that she fancied them to be and if they were not she would not think of them at all they were not likely to accept of her still though we may account for her conduct its issue was not on that account the less painful she had neither the promise of this world nor of the next and was losing earth without gaining heaven our lord is reported to have said be ye good money-changers poor callista did not know how to turn herself to account it had been so all through her short life she had ardent affections and keen sensibilities and high aspirations but she was not fortunate in the application of them she had put herself into her brother's hands and had let him direct her course it could not be expected that he would be very different from the world we are cautioned against rejoicing in our youth aristo rejoiced in his without restraint and he made his sister rejoice in hers if enjoyment it was he himself found in the pleasures he pointed out a banquet of fruits she dust and ashes and so she went on not changing her life from habit from the captivity of nature but weary disappointed fastidious hungry yet not knowing what she would have yearning after something she did not well know what and as heretofore she had cast her lot with the world yet had received no price for her adhesion so now she had bid it farewell yet had nothing to take in its place as to her brother after the visit of polemo he got more and more annoyed angry rather than distressed and angry with her one more opportunity occurred of her release and it was the last effort he made to move her cornelius in spite of his pomposity had acted the part of a real friend he wrote from carthage that he had happily succeeded in his application to government and difficult and unusual as was the grace had obtained her release he sent the formal documents for carrying it through the court and gained the eager benediction of the excitable aristo he rushed with the parchments to the magistrates who recognized them as sufficient and got an order for admission to her room joy my dearest he cried you are free we will leave this loathsome country by the first vessel i have seen the magistrates already the colour came into her wan face she clasped her hands together and looked earnestly at aristo he proceeded to explain the process of liberation she would not be called on to sacrifice but must sign a writing to the effect that she had done so and there would be an end of the whole matter on the first statement she saw no difficulty in the proposal and started up in animation presently her countenance fell how could she say that she had done what it was treason to her inward guide to do 
what was the difference between acknowledging a blasphemy by a signature or by incense she smiled sorrowfully at him shook her head and lay down again upon her rushes she had anticipated the church's judgment on the case of the libelatici aristo could not at first believe he heard aright that she refused to be saved by what seemed to him a matter of legal form and his anger grew so high as to eclipse and to shake his affection lost girl he cried i abandon you to the furies and he shook his clenched hand at her he turned away and said he would never see her again and he kept his word he never came again he took refuge with less restraint than was usual to him in such pleasures as the city could supply and strove to drive his sister from his mind by dissipation he mixed in the games of the compass martius under the shadow of the mountain took part with the revellers in the forum and ended the evening at the thermae sometimes the image of dear callista as once she looked would rush into his mind with a force which would not be denied and he would weep for a whole night at length he determined to destroy himself after the example of so many great men he gave a sumptuous entertainment expending his means upon it and invited his friends to partake of it it passed off with great gaiety nothing was wanting to make it equal to an occasion so special and singular he disclosed to his guests his purpose and they applauded the last libations were made the revellers departed the lights were extinguished aristo disappeared that night sicca never saw him again after some time it was found that he was at carthage and he had been provident enough to take with him some of his best working tools and some specimens of his own and poor callista's skill strange to say jucundus proved a truer friend to the poor girl than her brother in spite of his selfishness and hatred of christians he was considerably affected as her case got more and more serious and it became evident that only one answer could be returned to the magistrates from carthage he was quite easy about agellius who had as he considered successfully made off with himself and he was reconciled to the thought of never seeing him again had it not been for this one might have fancied that some lurking anxiety about the fate of his nephew might have kept alive the fidget which callista's dismal situation gave him for the philosopher tells us that pity always has something in it of self but under the circumstances it would be rash judgment to have any such suspicion of his motives he was not a cruel man even the hoary-headed fabian or cyprian or others whom he so roundly abused would have found when it came to the point that his bluster was his worst weapon against them at any rate he had enough of the milk of human kindness to feel considerable distress about that idiotic callista yet what could he do he might as well stop the passage of the sun as the movements of mighty rome and a rescript would be coming to a certainty in due time from carthage and would just say one thing which would forthwith be passing into the region of fact he had no one to consult and to tell the truth callista's fate was more than acquiesced in by the public of sicca her death seemed a solution of various perplexities and troubles into which the edict had brought them it would be purchasing the praise of loyalty cheaply moreover there were sets of men actually hostile to her and her brother the companies of statuaries lapidaries and goldsmiths were jealous of foreign artists like them who showed contempt for africa and who were acquainted or rather intimate with many of the higher classes and even high personages in the place well but could not some of those great people help her now his mind glanced towards calphurnius whom he had heard of as in some way or other protecting her on the evening of the riot and to him he determined to betake himself calphurnius and the soldiery were still in high dudgeon with the populace of sicca displeased with the magistrates and full of sympathy for callista jucundus opened his mind fully to the tribune and persuaded him to take him to septimius his military superior and in the presence of the latter many good words were uttered both by calphurnius and jucundus 
to Kundus gave it as his opinion that it was a very great mistake to strike at any but the leaders of the Christian sect. He quoted the story of King Tarquin and the puppies, and assured the great man that it was what he had always said and always prophesied, and that, depend upon it, it was a great mistake not to catch Cyprianus. The strong arm of the law, he said, should not, on the other hand, be put forth against such butterflies as this Callista, a girl who, he knew from her brother, had not yet seen eighteen summers. What harm could such a poor, helpless thing possibly do? She could not even defend herself, much less attack anybody else. No, he continued, your proper policy with these absurd people is a smiling face and an open hand. Recollect the fable of the sun and the wind, which made the traveller lay aside his cloak. Do you fall in with some sour-visaged, stiff-backed worshipper of the Furies? Fill his cup for him, crown his head with flowers, bring in the flute-women. Observe him, he relaxes, a smile spreads on his countenance, he laughs at a jest. Captus est, habet, he pours a libation. Great Jove has conquered, he is loyal to Rome. What can you desire more? But beat him, kick him, starve him, turn him out of doors, and you have a natural enemy to do you a mischief whenever he can. Calphurnius took his own line, and a simple one. If it was some vile slave or scoundrel African, he said, no harm would have been done. But by Jupiter Tonnens, it's a Greek girl who sings like a muse, dances like a grace, and spouts verses like Minerva. Twould be sacrilege to touch a hair of her head, and we forsooth are to let these cowardly dogs of magistrates entrap Fortunianus at Carthage into this solecism. Septimius said nothing, as became a man in office, but he came to an understanding with his visitors. It was plain that the duumvirs of Sicca had no legal custody of Callista. In a criminal matter she might seem to fall under the jurisdiction of the military, and Calphurnius gained leave to claim his right at the proper moment. The rest of his plan the tribune kept to himself, nor did Septimius wish to know it. He intended to march a guard into the prison shortly before Callista was brought out for execution, and then to make it believed that she had died under the horrors of the Barathrum. The corpse of another woman could without difficulty be found to be her representative, and she herself would be carried off to the camp. Meanwhile, to return to the prisoner herself, what was the consolation, what the occupation of Callista in this waiting time, ere the proconsul had sent his answer? Strange to say, and, we suppose, from a sinful waywardness in her, she had, up to this moment, neglected to avail herself of a treasure, which by a rare favour had been put into her possession. A small parchment, carefully written, elaborately adorned, lay in her bosom, which might already have been the remedy of many a perplexity, many a woe. It is difficult to say under what feelings she had been reluctant to open the holy gospel, which Cecilius had entrusted to her care. Whether she was so low and despondent that she could not make the effort, or whether she feared to convince herself further, or whether she professed to be waiting for some calmer time, as if that were possible, or whether her unwillingness was that which makes sick people so averse to eating, or to remedies which they know would be useful to them, cannot well be determined. But there are many of us who may be able, from parallel instances of infirmity, to enter into that state of mind which led her at least to procrastinate what she might do any minute. However, now left absolutely to herself, Aristo gone, and the answer of the government to the magistracy not having yet come, she recurred to the parchment, and to the bishop's words, which ran, Here you will see who it is we love, or language to that effect. It was tightly lodged under her girdle, and so had escaped in the confusion of that terrible evening. She opened it at length and read. It was the writing of a provincial Greek, elegant, however, and marked with that simplicity which was to her taste the elementary idea of a classic author. 
it was addressed to one theophilus and professed to be a carefully digested and verified account of events which had been already attempted by others she read a few paragraphs and became interested and in no long time she was absorbed in the volume when she had once taken it up she did not lay it down even at other times she would have prized it but now when she was so desolate and lonely it was simply a gift from an unseen world it opened a view of a new state and community of beings which only seemed too beautiful to be possible but not into a new state of things alone but into the presence of one who was simply distinct and removed from anything that she had in her most imaginative moments ever depicted to her mind as ideal perfection here was that to which her intellect tended though that intellect could not frame it it could approve and acknowledge when set before it what it could not originate here was he who spoke to her in her conscience whose voice she heard whose person she was seeking for here was he who kindled a warmth on the cheek of both Keone and agellius that image sank deep into her she felt it to be a reality she said to herself this is no poet's dream it is the delineation of a real individual there is too much truth and nature and life and exactness about it to be anything else yet she shrank from it it made her feel her own difference from it and a feeling of humiliation came upon her mind such as she never had had before she began to despise herself more thoroughly day by day yet she recollected various passages in the history which reassured her amid her self-debasement especially that of his tenderness and love for the poor girl at the feast who would anoint his feet and the full tears stood in her eyes and she fancied she was that sinful child and that he did not repel her oh what a new world of thought she had entered it occupied her mind from its very novelty everything looked dull and dim by the side of it her brother had ever been dinning into her ears that maxim of the heathen enjoy the present trust nothing to the future she indeed could not enjoy the present with that relish which he wished and she had not any trust in the future either but this volume spoke a different doctrine there she learned the very opposite to what aristo taught viz that the present must be sacrificed for the future that what is seen must give way to what is believed nay more she drank in the teaching which at first seemed so paradoxical that even present happiness and present greatness lie in relinquishing what at first sight seems to promise them that the way to true pleasure is not through self-indulgence but through mortification that the way to power is weakness the way to success failure the way to wisdom foolishness the way to glory dishonor she saw that there was a higher beauty than that which the order and harmony of the natural world revealed and a deeper peace and calm than that which the exercise whether of the intellect or of the purest human affection can supply she now began to understand that strange unearthly composure which had struck her in Keone, agellius and cacilius she understood that they were detached from the world not because they had not the possession nor the natural love of its gifts but because they possessed a higher blessing already which they loved above everything else thus by degrees callista came to walk by a new philosophy and had ideas and principles and a sense of relations and aims and a susceptibility of arguments to which before she was an utter stranger life and death action and suffering fortunes and abilities all had now a new meaning and application as the skies speak differently to the philosopher and the peasant as a book of poems to the imaginative and to the cold and narrow intellect so now she saw her being her history her present condition her future in a new light which no one else could share with her 
but the ruling sovereign thought of the whole was he who exemplified all this wonderful philosophy in himself end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Torres Vedras. There were those, however, whom Callista could understand and who could understand her. There were those who, while Aristo, Cornelius, Jucundus, and Polemo were moving in her behalf, were interesting themselves also in her and in a more effectual way. Agellius had joined Cecilius and if in no other way by his mouth came to the latter and his companions the news of her imprisonment on the morning that agellius had been so strangely let out of confinement by his brother and found himself seated at the street door with his tunic on his arm and his boots on the ground before him his first business was to recollect where he was and to dispose of those articles of dress according to their respective uses what should he do with himself was of course his second thought he could not stay there long without encountering the early risers of sicca the gates being already open to attempt to find out where callista was and then to see her or rescue her would have ended at once in his own capture to go to his own farm would have been nearly as dangerous and would have had less meaning Cecilius too had said that they were not long to be separated and had given him directions for finding him immediately then he made his way to one of the eastern gates which led to tiber succumber there was indeed no time to be lost as he soon had indications he met several men who knew him by sight and one of the apparitors of the duumviri who happily did not an apostate christian whose zeal for the government was notorious passed him and looked back after him however he would soon be out of pursuit if he had the start of them until the sun got round the mountains he was seeking he walked on through a series of rocky and barren hills till he got some way past the second milestone before he had reached the third he had entered a defile in the mountains perpendicular rocks rose on each side of him and the level road reaching from rock to rock was not above thirty feet across he felt that if he was pursued here there was no escape the third milestone passed he came to the country road he pursued it counting out his thousand steps as cecilius had instructed him by this time it had left the stony bottom and was rising up the side of the precipice brushwood and dwarf pines covered it mingled with a few olives and carobas he said out his seven paternosters as he walked and then looked around he had just passed a goat herd and they looked hard at each other agellius wished him good morning you are wishing a kid for bacchus sir said the man to him as he was running his eye over the goats on agellius answering in the negative he said in a clownish way he who does not sacrifice to bacchus does not sacrifice goats agellius bearing in mind cecilius's directions saw of course there was something in the words which did not meet the ear and answered carelessly he who does not sacrifice does not sacrifice to bacchus true said the man but perhaps you prefer a lamb for a sacrifice agellius replied if it is the right one but the one i mean was slain long since the man without any change of manner went on to say that there was an acquaintance of his not far up the rock who could perhaps satisfy him on the point he said follow those wild olives though the path seems broken and you will come to him at the nineteenth agellius set out and never was path so untrue to its own threats it seemed ending in abrupt cliffs every turn but never fulfilled the anticipation that is while he kept to the olive trees after ascending what was rather a flight of marble steps washed and polished by the winter torrents than a series of crags he fulfilled the number of trees and looked round at the man sitting under it oh the joy and surprise it was his old servant aspar you are safe then aspar he said and i find you here oh what a tender providence i have taken my stand here master 
returned aspar day after day since i got here in hopes of seeing you i could not get back to you from jucundus's that dreadful morning and so i made my way here your uncle sent for you in my presence but at the time i did not know what it meant i was able to escape and now for cacilius said agellius behind the olive tree a torrent's bed descended the descent being so easy and yet so natural that art had evidently interfered with nature yet concealed its interference after tracing it some yards they came to a chasm on the opposite side and passing through it agellius soon found himself to his surprise on a bleak open hill to which the huge mountain formed merely a sort of facade its surface was half rock half moor and it was surrounded by precipices it was such a place as some hermit of the middle ages might have chosen for his solitude the two walked briskly across it and at length came to a low broad yawning opening branching out into several passages which if pursued would have been found to end in nothing aspar however made straight for what appeared a dead wall of rock in which on his making the signal a door skilfully hidden was opened from within and was shut behind them by the porter they now stood in a gallery running into the mountain it was very long and a stream of cold air came along it aspar told him that at the extremity of it they should find cacilius agellius was indeed in the vestibule of a remarkable specimen of those caves which had been used for religious purposes first by the aborigines of the country then by the phoenician colonists and in the centuries which had just passed for the concealment of the christians the passage along which they were proceeding might itself be fitly called a cave but still it was only one of several natural subterraneans of different shapes and opening into each other some of them lay along the face of a ravine from which they received light and air and here in one place there were indications of a fortified front they were perfectly dry though the water had at some remote period filtered through the roof and had formed pendants and pillars of semi-transparent stalactite of great beauty it was another and singular advantage that a particular spot in one of the caverns which bordered on the ravine was the focus of an immense ear or whispering gallery such that whatever took place in the public road in which the ravine terminated could be distinctly heard there and thus they were always kept on guard against the attack of an enemy if expected had either agellius or aspar been curious about such a matter the latter might have pointed out the place where a punic altar once had been discovered with a sort of tumulus of bones of mice near at hand that animal coming into the list of victims in the phoenician worship but the two christians were engaged as they first halted and then walked along the corridor in other thoughts than in asking and answering questions about the history of the place of refuge in which they found themselves we have already remarked on the central position of sicca for the purpose of missionary work and of retreat in persecution such a dwelling in the rocks did but increase its advantageousness and in consequence at this moment many christians had availed themselves of it it is an english proverb that three removes are as bad as a fire and so great were the perils and the hardships of flight in those times that it was a question in a merely earthly point of view whether the risk of being apprehended at home was not a far less evil than the evils which were certain upon leaving it there was nothing then ungenerous in the ecclesiastical rule that they alone should flee in persecution who were marked out for death if they stayed the laity private families and the priests on whose ministrations they depended remained bishops deacons and what may be called the staff of the episcopate notaries messengers seminarists and ascetics would disappear from the scene of persecution agellius learned from his slave that the cave had been known to him from the time he was a boy and that it was one of the secrets which all who shared it religiously observed holy men it seemed had had intimations of the present trial for several years past and it was the full persuasion of the heads of the church that though it might blow over for a short time it would recur at intervals for many years ending in a visitation so heavy and long that the times of antichrist would seem to have arrived 
however the impression upon their minds was that then would come a millennium or in some sort a reign of the saints upon the earth that however was a date which even agellius himself young as he was would not be likely to reach indeed who could expect to escape who might not hope to gain a martyr's death in the interval in the series of assaults between which christianity had to run the gauntlet aspar said moreover that some martyrs lay in the chapels within and that various confessors had ended their days there at the present time there were representatives there collected of a large portion of the churches of the proconsulate a post so to call it went between them and carthage every week and his friend and father the bishop of that city was especially busy in correspondence moreover agellius learned from him that they had many partisans well-wishers and sympathizers about the country whom no one suspected the families of parents who had conformed to the established worship nay sometimes the apostates themselves and that this was the case in sicca as well as elsewhere for himself old and ignorant as he was the persecution had proved to him an education he had been brought near great men and some who he was confident would be martyrs in the event he had learned a great deal about his religion which he did not know before and had drunk in the spirit of christianity with a fullness which he trusted would not turn to his ultimate condemnation he now too had a consciousness of the size and populousness of the church of her diffusion of the promises made to her of the essential necessity of what seemed to be misfortune of the episcopal regimen and of the power and solidity of the see of peter afar off in rome all which knowledge had made him quite another being we have put all this into finer language than the good old man used himself and we have grouped it more exactly but this is what his words would come to when explained coming down to sublunary matters aspar said the cave was well provisioned they had bread oil figs dried grapes and wine they had vessels and vestments for the holy sacrifice their serious want was a dearth of water at that season but they relied on divine providence to give them by miracle if in no other way a supply the place was piercingly cold too in the winter by this time they had gained the end of the long gallery and passed through a second apartment when suddenly the sounds of the ecclesiastical chant burst on the ear of agellius how strange how transporting to him he was almost for the first time coming home to his father's house though he had been a christian from a child and never as he trusted to leave it now that it was found he did not know how to behave himself nor indeed where to go aspar conducted him into the seats set apart for the faithful he knelt down and burst into tears it was approaching the third hour the hour at which the paraclete originally descended upon the apostles and which when times of persecution were past was appointed in the west for the solemn mass of the day in that early age indeed the time of the solemnity was generally midnight in order to elude observation but even then such an hour was considered of but temporary arrangement pope telesphorus is said to have prescribed the hour afterwards in use as early even as the second century and in a place of such quiet and security as the cavern in which we just now find ourselves there was no reason why it should not be selected at the lower end of the chapel was a rail extending across it and open in the middle where its two portions turned up at right angles on each side towards the altar the enclosure thus made was the place proper for the faithful into which agellius had been introduced and about fifty persons were collected about him where the two side rails which ran up the chapel ceased there was a broad step and upon it two pulpits one on each side then came a second elevation carrying the eye on to the extremity of the upper end in the middle of the wall at that upper end is a recess occupied by a tomb on the front of it is written the name of some glorious champion of the faith who lies there it is one of the first bishops of sicca and the inscription attests that he slept in the lord under the emperor antoninus over the sacred relics is a slab and on the slab the divine mysteries are now to be celebrated 
at the back is a painting on the wall very similar to that in agellius's cottage the ever-blessed immaculate mother of god is exercising her office as the advocate of sinners standing by the sacrifice as she stood at the cross itself and offering up and applying its infinite merits and incommunicable virtue in union with priest and people so instinctive in the christian mind is the principle of decoration as it may be called that even in times of suffering and places of banishment we see it brought into exercise not only is the arch which overspans the altar ornamented with an arabesque pattern but the roof or vault is coloured with paintings our lord is in the centre with two figures of moses on each side on the right unloosing his sandals on the left striking the rock between the centre figure and the altar may be seen the raising of lazarus in the opposite partition the healing of the paralytic at the four angles are men and women alternately in the attitude of prayer at this time the altar stone was covered with a rich crimson silk with figures of st peter and st paul worked in gold upon it the gift of a pious lady of carthage beyond the altar but not touching it was a cross and on one side of the altar a sort of basin or piscina cut in the rock with a linen cloth hanging up against it there were no candles upon the altar itself but wax lights fixed into silver stands were placed at intervals along the edge of the presbytery or elevation the mass was in behalf of the confessors for the faith then in prison in carthage and the sacred ministers some half hour after agellius's entrance made their appearance their vestments already varied somewhat from the ordinary garments of the day and bespoke antiquity and though not so simply sui generis as they are now they were so far special that they were never used on any other occasion but were reserved for the sacred service the neck was bare the amice being as yet unknown instead of the stole was what was called the orarium a sort of handkerchief resting on the shoulders and falling down on each side the alb had been an inner garment or chemesium which in civil use was retained at night when the other garments were thrown off and as at the present day it was confined around the waist by a zone or girdle the maniple was a napkin supplying the place of a handkerchief and the chasuble was an ample penula such as was worn by the judges a cloak enveloping the whole person round when spread out with an opening in the centre through which the head might pass the deacon's dalmatic was much longer than it is now and the subdeacon's tunical resembled the alb all the vestments were of the purest white the mass began by the bishop giving his blessing and then the lector a man of venerable age taking the roll called lectionarium and proceeding to a pulpit read the prophets to the people much in the way observed among ourselves still on holy saturday and the vigil of pentecost these being finished the people chanted the first verse of the gloria patri after which the clergy alternated with the people the curie pretty much as the custom is now here a fresh roll was brought to the lector then or afterwards called apostolus from which he read one of the canonical epistles a psalm followed which was sung by the people and after this the lector received the evangeliarium and read a portion of the gospel at which lights were lighted and the people stood when he had finished the lector opened the roll wide and turning round presented it to bishop clergy and people to kiss the deacon then cried out ite in pace catechumeni depart in peace catechumens and then the kiss of peace was passed round and the people began to sing some psalms or hymns while they were so engaged the deacon received from the acolyte the sindon or corporal which was of the length of the altar and perhaps of greater breadth and spread it upon the sacred table next was placed on the sindon the oblata that is the small loaves according to the number of communicants with the paten which was large and a gold chalice duly prepared and then the sindon or corporal was tucked back over them to cover them as a pall the celebrant then advanced he stood at the further side of the altar where the candles are now with his face to the people and then began the holy sacrifice first he incensed the oblata that is the loaves and chalice as an acknowledgment of god's sovereign dominion and as a token of uplifted prayer to him 
then the roll of prayers was brought him while the deacon began what is sometimes called the bidding prayer being a catalogue of the various subjects for which intercession is to be made after the manner of the oremus delectissimi now used on good friday this catalogue included all conditions of men the conversion of the world the exaltation of holy church the maintenance of the roman empire the due ripening and gathering of the fruits of the earth and other spiritual and temporal blessings subjects very much the same as those which are now called the pope's intentions the prayers ended with a special reference to those present that they might persevere in the lord even to the end and then the priest began the sursum corda and said the sanctus the canon or axio seems to have run in all but a few words as it does now and the solemn words of consecration were said secretly great stress was laid on the lord's prayer which in one sense terminated the function it was said aloud by the people and when they said forgive us our trespasses they beat their breasts it is not wonderful that agellius assisting for almost the first time at this wonderful solemnity should have noted everything as it occurred and we must be considered as giving our account of it from his mouth it needs not to enlarge on the joy of the meeting which followed between cacilius and his young penitent oh my father he said i have come to thee never to leave thee to be thy dutiful servant and to be trained by thee after the pattern of him who made thee what thou art wonderful things have happened callista is in prison on the charge of christianity i was in a sort of prison myself or what was worse for my soul and juba my brother in the strangest of ways has this morning let me out shall she not be saved my father in god's own way as well as i at least we can all pray for her but surely we can do more so precious a soul must not be left to herself and the world if she has the trials she may claim the blessings of a christian is she to go back to heathenism is she alas to suffer without baptism shall we not hazard death to bestow on her that grace end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain the baptism we have already had occasion to mention that there were many secret well-wishers or at least protectors of christians as in the world at large so also in sicca there were many persons who had received benefits from their charity and had experience of the scandalous falsehood of the charges now circulated against them others would feel a generosity towards a cruelly persecuted body others utterly dead to the subject of religion or rather believing all religions to be impostures would not allow it to be assumed that only one was worthy of bad treatment others liked what they heard of the religion itself and thought there was truth in it though it had no claim to a monopoly of truth others felt it to be true but shrank from the consequences of openly embracing it others who had apostatized through fear of the executioner intended to come back to it at the last it must be added that in the african church confessors in prison had or were considered to have the remarkable privilege of gaining the public forgiveness of the church for those who had lapsed it was an object then for all those who being in that miserable case wished some day to be restored to gain their promise of assistance or their good will to these reasons was added in callista's case the interest which naturally attached to a woman young and defenceless the burning sun of africa is at the height of its power the population is prostrated by heat by scarcity by pestilence and by the decimation which their riot brought upon them they care neither for christianity nor for anything else just now they lie in the porticoes in the caverns under the city in the baths they are more alive at night the apparitor in whose dwelling callista was lodged who was himself once a christian lies in the shade of the great doorway into which his rooms open asleep or stupefied two men make their appearance about two hours before sunset and demand admittance to callista 
the jailer asks if they are not the two greeks her brother and the rhetorician who had visited her before the junior of the strangers drops a purse heavy with coin into his lap and passes on with his companion when the mind is intent on great subjects or aims heat and cold hunger and thirst lose their power of enfeebling it thus perhaps we must account for the energy now displayed both by the two ecclesiastics and by callista herself she too thought it was the unwelcome philosopher come again she gave a start and a cry of delight when she saw it was cacilius my father she said i want to be a christian if i may he came to save the lost sheep i have learnt such things from this book let me give it you while i can i am not long for this world give me him who spoke so kindly to that woman take from me my load of sin and then i will gladly go she knelt at his feet and gave the roll of parchment into his hand rise and sit he answered let us think calmly over the matter i am ready she insisted deny me not my wish when time is so urgent if i may have it sit down calmly he said again i am not refusing you but i wish to know about you he could hardly keep from tears of pain or of joy or of both when he saw the great change which trial had wrought in her what touched him most was the utter disappearance of that majesty of mien which once was hers a gift so beautiful so unsuitable to fallen man there was instead of it a frank humility a simplicity without concealment an unresisting meekness which seemed as if it would enable her if trampled on to smile and to kiss the feet that insulted her she had lost every vestige of what the world worships under the titles of proper pride and self-respect callista was now living not in the thought of herself but of another god has been very good to you he continued but in the volume you have returned to me he bids us reckon the charges can you drink of his chalice recollect what is before you she still continued kneeling with a touching earnestness of face and demeanour and with her hands crossed upon her breast i have reckoned she replied heaven and hell i prefer heaven you are on earth said cacilius not in heaven or hell you must bear the pangs of earth before you drink the blessedness of heaven he has given me the firm purpose she said to gain heaven to escape hell and he will give me too the power ah callista he answered in a voice broken with distress you know not what you will have to bear if you join yourself to him he has done great things for me already i am wonderfully changed i am not what i was he will do more still alas my child said cacilius that feeble frame ah how will it bear the strong iron or the keen flame or the ruthless beast my child what do i feel who am free thus handing you over to be the sport of the evil one father i have chosen him she answered not hastily but on deliberation i believe him most absolutely keep me not from him give him to me if i may ask it give me my love presently she added i have never forgotten those words of yours since you used them amor meus crucifixus est she began again i will be a christian give me my place among them give me my place at the feet of jesus son of mary my god i wish to love him i think i can love him make me his he has loved you from eternity said cacilius and therefore you are now beginning to love him she covered her eyes with her hands and remained in profound meditation i am very ignorant very sinful she said at length but one thing i know that there is but one to love in the whole world and i wish to love him i surrender myself to him if he will take me 
and he shall teach me about himself the angry multitude their fierce voices the brutal executioner the prison the torture the slow painful death he was speaking not to her but to himself she was calm in spite of her fervour but he could not contain himself his heart melted within him he felt like abraham lifting up his hand to slay his child time passes she said what may happen you may be discovered but perhaps she added suddenly changing her tone it is a matter of long initiation woe is me we must gird ourselves to the work victor he said to his deacon who was with him cacilius fell back and sat down and victor came forward he formally instructed her so far as the circumstances allowed not for baptism only but for confirmation and holy eucharist for cacilius determined to give her all three sacraments at once it was a sight for angels to look down upon and they did when the poor child rich in this world's gifts but poor in those of eternity knelt down to receive that sacred stream upon her brow which fell upon her with almost sensible sweetness and suddenly produced a serenity different in kind from anything she had ever before even had the power of conceiving the bishop gave her confirmation and then the holy eucharist it was her first and last communion in a few days she renewed it or rather completed it under the very face and form of him whom she now believed without seeing farewell my dearest of children said cacilius till the hour when we both meet before the throne of god a few sharp pangs which you can count and measure and all will be well you will be carried through joyously and like a conqueror i know it you could face the prospect before you were a christian and you will be equal to the actual trial now that you are never fear me father she said in a clear low voice the bishop and his deacon left the prison the sun had all but set when cacilius and victor passed the city gate and it was more than twilight as they crossed the wild hills leading to the precipitous pass evil men were not their only peril in this work of charity they were also in danger from wild beasts in these lone wastes and the heathen would have added from bad spirits bad spirits cacilius recognized too but he would not have granted that they were perilous the two went forward saying prayers lowly and singing psalms when a sudden cry was heard and a strong tall form rushed past them it might be some robber of the wild or dangerous outcast or savage fanatic who knew and hated their religion however when they stopped and looked he had come and he was gone but he came again and more slowly and from his remarkable shape cacilius saw that it was the brother of agellius he said juba juba started back and stood at a distance cacilius held out his hand and called him on again mentioning his name the poor fellow came nearer cacilius's day's work was not at an end since we last heard of him juba had dwelt in the mountainous tract over which the two christians were now passing roaming to and fro or beating himself in idle fury against the adamantine rocks and fighting with the stern necessity of the elements how he was sustained can hardly be guessed unless the impulse which led him on the first accession of his fearful malady to fly upon the beasts of the desert served him here also roots too and fruits were scattered over the wild and still more so in the ravines wherever any quantity of soil had been accumulated alas had the daylight lasted in him too as well as in callista cacilius would have found changes but of a very different nature yet even in him he would have seen a change for the better for that old awful expression of pride and defiance was gone what was the use of parading a self-will which every moment of his life belied his actions his words his hands his lips his feet his place of abode his daily course were in the dominion of another who inexorably ruled him it was not the gentle influence which draws and persuades 
it was not the power which can be propitiated by prayer it was a tyranny which acted without reaction energetic as mind and impenetrable as matter juba said cacilius a third time the maniac came nearer and then again suddenly retreated he stood at a short distance from cacilius as if afraid to come on and cried out tossing his hands wildly away black hypocrite come not near me away hound of a priest cross not my path lest i tear you to shreds such visitations were no novelties to cacilius he raised his hand and made the sign of the cross then he said come juba advanced shrieked and used some terrible words and rushed upon cacilius as if he would treat him as he had treated the savage wolf come he cried yes i come and victor ran up fearing his teeth would be in cacilius's throat if he delayed longer the latter stood his ground quailing neither in eye nor in limb he made the sign of the cross a second time and in spite of a manifest antagonism within him the stricken youth with horrid cries came dancing after him thus they proceeded with some signs of insurrection from time to time on juba's part but with a successful reduction of it as often on the part of cacilius till they got to the ascent by the olive trees where careful walking was necessary then cacilius turned round and beckoned him he came he said kneel down he knelt down cacilius put his hand on his head saying to him follow me close and without any disturbance the three pursued their journey and all arrived safe at the cavern there cacilius gave juba in charge to romanus who had been entrusted with the energumens at carthage End of chapter thirty one Chapter Thirty Two of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Imperial Rescript. Had the Imperial Edict been acted on by the magistrates of Sicca without a reference to Carthage, it is not easy to suppose that Callista would have persevered in her refusal to commit the act of idolatry required of her. But to speak of second causes, the hesitation of her judges was her salvation once baptized there was no reason she should desire any further delay of her conflict come it must and come it did while cacilius was placing her beyond danger the rescript of the proconsul had been received at the office of the duumvirs the absence of the proconsul from carthage had been the cause of the delay and then some investigation was needed to understand the relation of callista's seizure to the riot on the one hand and to the strong act of the military on the other in quelling it it was thought that something or other might come to light to account for the anomalous and unaccountable position which she had taken up the imperial government considered it had now a clear view of her case and its orders were distinct and peremptory christianity was to cease to be it was a subtle foe sapping the vitals of the state rome must perish or this illegal association such evasions as callista had used were but instances of its craft its treason lay not in its being christianity but in its not sacrificing to the gods of rome callista was but throwing dust in their eyes there had been no blow struck against the treason in inland africa women had often been the most dangerous of conspirators as she was a stranger there was more probability of her connection with secret societies and also less inconvenience in her execution whatever happened she was to be got rid of but first her resolution was to be broken for the sake of the example first let her be brought before the tribunal and threatened then thrust into the tullianum then put upon the rack and returned to prison then scorched over a slow fire last of all beheaded and left for beasts of prey she would sacrifice ere the last stage was reached when she had given way let her be given up to the gladiators 
the message ended by saying that the proconsular procurator who came by the same carriages would preside at the process o oh, wisdom of the world and strength of the world what are you when matched beside the foolishness and the weakness of the christian you are great in resources manifold in methods hopeful in prospects but one thing you have not and that is peace you are always tumultuous restless apprehensive you have nothing you can rely upon you have no rock under your feet but the humblest feeblest christian has that which is impossible to you callista had once felt the misery of maladies akin to yours she had passed through doubt anxiety perplexity despondency passion but now she was in peace now she feared the torture or the flame as little as the breeze which arose at nightfall or the busy chatter of the grasshoppers at the noonday nay rather she did not think of torture and death at all but was possessed by a peace which bore her up as if bodily on its mighty wings for hours she remained on her knees after cacilius left her then she lay down on her rushes and slept her last sleep she slept sound she dreamed she thought she was no longer in africa but in her own greece more sunny and bright than before but the inhabitants were gone its majestic mountains its rich plains its expanse of waters all silent no one to converse with no one to sympathize with and as she wandered on and wondered suddenly its face changed and its colors were illuminated tenfold by a heavenly glory and each hue upon the scene was of a beauty she had never known and seemed strangely to affect all her senses at once being fragrance and music as well as light and there came out of the grottoes and glens and woods and out of the seas myriads of bright images whose forms she could not discern and these came all around her and became a sort of scene or landscape which she could not have described in words as if it were a world of spirits not of matter and as she gazed she thought she saw before her a well-known face only glorified she who had been a slave now was arrayed more brilliantly than an oriental queen and she looked at callista with a smile so sweet that callista felt she could but dance to it and as she looked more earnestly doubting whether she should begin or not the face changed and now was more marvellous still it had an innocence in its look and also a tenderness which bespoke both maid and mother and so transported callista that she must needs advance towards her out of love and reverence and the lady seemed to make signs of encouragement so she began a solemn measure unlike all dances of earth with hands and feet serenely moving on towards what she heard some of them call a great action and a glorious consummation though she did not know what they meant at length she was fain to sing as well as dance and her words were in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost on which another said a good beginning of the sacrifice and when she had come close to this gracious figure there was a fresh change the face the features were the same but the light of divinity now seemed to beam through them and the hair parted and hung down long on each side of the forehead and there was a crown of another fashion than the ladies round about it made of what looked like thorns and the palms of the hands were spread out as if towards her and there were marks of wounds in them and the vestment had fallen and there was a deep opening in the side and as she stood entranced before him and motionless she felt a consciousness that her own palms were pierced like his and her feet also and she looked round and saw the likeness of his face and of his wounds upon all that company and now they were suddenly moving on and bearing something or some one heavenwards and they too began to sing and their words seemed to be rejoice with me for i have found my sheep ever repeated 
they went up through an avenue or long grotto with torches of diamonds and amethysts and sapphires which lit up its spars and made them sparkle and she tried to look but could not discover what they were carrying till she heard a very piercing cry which awoke her end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain a good confession the cry came from the keeper's wife whom we have described as kindly disposed to her she was a libo phoenician and spoke a broken latin but the language of sympathy is universal in spite of babel callista she exclaimed girl they have sent for you you ought to die oh frightful worse than a runaway slave the torture give in what's the arm you're so young those terrible men with the pincers and white bars callista sat up and passed from her vision to her prison she smiled and said i am ready i am going home the woman looked almost frightened and with some shade of disgust and disappointment she as others might have thought it impossible as it was unaccountable that when it came to the point callista would hold out she's crazed she said i am ready mother callista said and she got up you have been very good to me she continued i have been saying many prayers for you while my prayers were of no good for then he was not mine but now i have espoused him and am going to be married to-day and he will hear me the woman stared at her stupidly as much as to make it evident that if afterwards a change took place in her as in callista that change too though in so different a soul must come of something beyond nature she had something in her hand and said it's useless to give a mad woman like her the packet which my man has brought me callista took the packet which was directed to her and broke the seal it was from her brother the little roll of worn parchment opened a dagger fell out some lines were written on the parchment they were dated carthage and ran as follows aristo to his dearest callista i write through cornelius you have not had it in your power to kill me but you have taken away half my life for me i will cherish the other half for i love life better than death but you love annihilation yet if so die not like a slave die nobly mindful of your country i send you the means callista was beyond reflecting on anything around her except as in a sort of dream as common men think and speak of heaven so she now thought and spoke of earth i wish him to kill me not myself she said i am his victim my brother i have no brother except one who is calling me she was carried to court and the examination followed we have already given a specimen of such a process and here it will be sufficient to make use of two documents different in kind as far as they go which have come down to us the first is an alto relief which once was colored not first-rate in art or execution and of the date of the emperor constantius about a century later it was lately discovered in the course of excavations made at el kaf the modern sicca on the ruins of a church or roman basilica for the building in question seems to have served each purpose successively in this sculpture the praetorium is represented and the tribunal of the president in it the tribunal is a high throne with wings curving round on each side making the whole construction extend to almost a semicircle and it is ascended by steps between the wings the curul chair is at the top of the steps and in the middle and above it are purple curtains reaching down to the platform drawn back on each side and when drawn close together running behind the chair and constituting what was called the secretarium on one side of the tribunal is a table covered with carpeting and looking something like a modern ottoman only higher and not level at top and it has upon it the book of mandates the sign of jurisdiction the sword too is represented in the sculpture to show a criminal case is proceeding 
the procurator is seated on the chair he is in purple and has a gold chain of triple thread we can also distinguish his lawyers whether assessors or consiliarii also his lictors and soldiers there too are the notaries in a line before him they are writing down the judge's questions and the prisoner's answers and one of them is turning round to her as if to make her speak more loudly she herself is mounted upon a sort of platform called catasta like that on which slaves were put up for sale two soldiers are by her who appear to have been dragging her forwards the executioners are also delineated naked to the waist with instruments of torture in their hands the second document is a fragment of the acta proconsularia of her passion if indeed it could be trusted to the letter as containing callista's answers word for word it would have a distinctly sacred character in consequence of our lord's words it shall be given you in that hour what to speak however we attach no such special value to this document since it comes to us through heathen notaries who may not have been accurate reporters not to say that before we did so we ought to look very carefully into its genuineness as it is we believe it to be as true as any part of our narrative and not truer it runs as follows Caius messius decius augustus the second and gratus consuls on the seventh before the calends of august in sicca veneria a colony in the secretary at the tribunal martianus procurator sitting callista a maker of images was brought up by the commentariensis on a charge of christianity and when she was placed marcianus the procurator said this folly has been too long you have made images and now you will not worship them callista answered for i have found my true love whom before i knew not marcianus the procurator said your true love is i ween your last love for all were true in their time callista said i worship my true love who is the only true and he is the son of god and i know none but him marcianus the procurator said you will not worship the gods but you are willing to love their sons callista said he is the true son of the true god and i am his and he is mine marcianus the procurator said let alone your loves and swear by the genius of the emperor callista said i have but one lord the king of kings the ruler of all marcianus the procurator turned to the lictor and said this folly is madness take her hand put incense in it and hold it over the flame callista said you may compel me by your great strength but my own true lord and love is stronger marcianus the procurator said you are bewitched but we must undo the spell take her to the lignum the prison for criminals callista said he has been there before me and he will come to me there marcianus the procurator said the jailer will see to that let her be brought up to-morrow on the day following marcianus the procurator sitting at the tribunal called up callista he said honour our lord and sacrifice to the gods callista said let me alone i am content with my one and only lord marcianus the procurator said what did he come to you in prison as you hoped callista said he came to me amid much pain and the pain was pleasant for he came in it marcianus the procurator said you have got worn and yellow and he will leave you callista said he loves me the more for i am beautiful when i am black marcianus the procurator said throw her into the tullianum perhaps she will find her god there also then the procurator entered into the secretary and drew the veil and dictated the sentence for the tabella then he came out and the praeco read it 
callista a senseless and reprobate woman is hereby sentenced to be thrown into the tulianum then to be stretched on the aquilius then to be placed on a slow fire lastly to be beheaded and left to the dogs and birds callista said thanks to my lord and king here the acta end and though they seem to want their conclusion yet they supply nearly everything which is necessary for our purpose the one subject on which a comment is needed is the state prison which though so little is said of it in the above report is in fact the real medium as we may call it for appreciating its information a few words will suffice for our purpose the state prison then was arranged on pretty much one and the same plan through the roman empire nay we may say throughout the ancient world it was commonly attached to the government buildings and consisted of two parts the first was the vestibule or outward prison which was a hall approached from the praetorium and surrounded by cells opening into it the prisoners who were confined in these cells had the benefit of the air and light which the hall admitted such was the place of confinement allotted to st paul at caesarea which is said to be the praetorium of herod and hence perhaps it is that in the touching passion of st perpetua and st felicitas st perpetua tells us that when permitted to have her child though she was in the inner portion which will next be described suddenly the prison seemed to her like the praetorium from this vestibule there was a passage into the interior prison called robur or lignum from the beams of wood which were the instruments of confinement or from the character of its floor it had no window or outlet except this door which when closed absolutely shut out light and air air indeed and coolness might be obtained for it by the barathrum presently to be spoken of but of what nature we shall then see the apartment called lignum was the place into which st paul and st silas were cast at philippi before it was known that they were romans after scourging them severely the magistrates who nevertheless were but the local authorities and had no proper jurisdiction in criminal cases put them in prison bidding the jailer to keep them carefully who on receiving such a command put them in the inner prison and fastened them in the lignum and in the acts of the skilletane martyrs we read of the proconsul giving sentence let them be thrown into prison let them be put into the lignum till to-morrow the utter darkness the heat and the stench of this miserable place in which the inmates were confined day and night is often dwelt upon by the martyrs and their biographers after a few days says saint perpetua we were taken to the prison and i was frightened for i never had known such darkness o oh, bitter day the heat was excessive by reason of the crowd there in the acts of saint peonius and others of smyrna we read that the jailers shut them up in the inner part of the prison so that bereaved of all comfort and light they were forced to sustain extreme torment from the darkness and stench of the prison and in like manner other martyrs of africa about the time of st cyprian's martyrdom that is eight or ten years later than the date of this story say we were not frightened at the foul darkness of that place for soon that murky prison was radiant with the brightness of the spirit what days what nights we passed there no words can describe the torments of that prison no statement can equal yet there was a place of confinement even worse than this in the floor of this inner prison was a sort of trap-door or hole opening into the barathrum or pit and called from the original prison at rome the tulianum sometimes prisoners were confined here sometimes dispatched by being cast headlong into it through the opening it was into this pit at rome that st chrysanthus was cast and there and probably in other cities it was nothing short of the public cesspool it may be noticed that the prophet jeremiah seems to have had personal acquaintance with the vestibule robur and barathrum we read in one place of his being shut up in the atrium that is the vestibule of the prison which was in the house of the king at another time he is in the ergastulum which would seem to be the inner prison 
lastly his enemies led him down by ropes into the lacus or pit in which there was no water but mud as to callista then after the first day's examination she was thrown for nearly twenty-four hours into the stifling rober or inner prison after the sentence on the second day she was let down as the commencement of her punishment that is of her martyrdom into the loathsome barathrum lacus or pit called tullianum there to lie for another twenty hours before she was brought out to the aculeus or rack End of chapter 33「thirty four of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Martyrdom Callista had sighed for the bright and clear atmosphere of Greece, and she was thrown into the rober and plunged into the barathrum of Sicca. But in reality, though she called it Greece, she was panting after a better country and a more lasting home, and this country and home she had found she was now setting out for it it was indeed no slight marvel that she was not already there she had been lowered into that pit of death before noon on the day of her second examination and accepting some unwholesome bread and water according to the custom of the prison had had no food since she came into the custody of the commentariensis the day before the order came from the magistrates to bring her out earlier in the morning than was intended or the prison might have really effected that death which calphurnius had proposed to pretend when the apparitors attempted to raise her she neither spoke or moved nor could well be seen black as orcus said one of the fellows another torch there i can't see where she nestles there she is like a bundle of clothes said another madam gets up late this morning said a third she's used to softer couches said a fourth ha ha tis a spoiler of beauty this hole said a fifth she is the demon of stubbornness and must be crushed said the jailer she likes it or she would not choose it the plague take the witch said another we shall have better seasons when a few like her are ferreted out they got her out like a corpse and put her on the ground outside the prison. When she still did not move, two of them took her between them on their shoulders and arms and began to move forward, the instrument of torture preceding her. The fresh air of the morning revived her. She soon sat up. She seemed to drink in life again and become conscious. Oh, beautiful, oh, beautiful light, she whispered. Oh, lovely light, my light and my life oh my life oh my light and my life receive me gradually she became fully alive to all that was going on she was going to death and that rather than deny him who had bought her by his own death he had suffered for her and she was to suffer for him he had been racked on the cross she too was to have her limbs dislocated after his pattern she scarcely rested on the men's shoulders and they vowed afterwards that they thought she was going to fly away vile witch as she was the witch the witch the mob screamed out for she had now come to the place of her conflict we'll pay you off for blight and pestilence where's our bread where's the maize and barley where are the grapes and they uttered fierce yells of execration and seemed disposed to break through the line of apparitors and to tear her to pieces yet after all it was not a very hearty uproar but got up for the occasion the populace had spent their force not to say their lives in the riot in which she was apprehended the priests and priestesses of the temples had sent the poor wretches and paid them the place of execution was on the northeast of the city outside the walls and towards the mountain it was where slaves were buried and it was as hideous as such spots usually were the neighborhood was wild open to the beasts of prey who at night used to descend and feast upon the corpses as callista approached to the scene of her suffering the expression of her countenance had so altered 
that a friend would scarce have known it there was a tenderness in it and a modesty which never had been there in that old time her cheek had upon it a blush as when the rising sun suddenly touches some grey rock or tower yet it was white and glistening too so much that others might have said it was like silver her eyes were larger than they had been and gazed steadfastly as if at what the multitude did not see her lips spoke of sweet peace and deep composure when at length she came close upon the rabble who had been screaming and yelling so fiercely men women and boys suddenly held their peace it was first from curiosity then from amazement then from awe at length a fear smote through them and a strange pity and reverence they almost seemed inclined to worship what stirred them so much they knew not how a new idea had visited those poor ignorant souls a few minutes sufficed to put the rack into working order she was laid down upon its board in her poor bedimmed tunic which once flashed so bright in the sun she who had been ever so delicate in her apparel her wrists and ankles were seized extended fastened to the movable blocks at the extremities of the plank she spoke her last word for thee my lord and love for thee accept me o my love upon this bed of pain and come to me o my love make haste and come the men turned round the wheels rapidly to and fro the joints were drawn out of their sockets and then snapped in again she had fainted they waited for her coming too they still waited they got impatient dash em water on her said one spit in her face and it will do said a second prick her with your spike said a third hold your wild talk said a fourth she's gone to the shades they gathered round and looked at her attentively they could not bring her back so it was she had gone to her lord and her love lay her out for the wolves and vultures said the cornicularius and he was going to appoint guards till nightfall when up came the stationarii and calphurnius in high wrath you dogs he cried what trick have you been practising against the soldiers of rome however expostulation and reproach were bootless nor would it answer here to go into the quarrel which ensued over the dead body the magistrates having got sense of calphurnius's scheme had outwitted the tribune by assigning an earlier hour than was usual for the execution life could not be recalled nor did the soldiers of course dare publicly to disobey the proconsul's order for the exposure of the corpse all that could be done they did they took her down with rude reverence from the rack and placed her on the sand and then they set guards to keep off the rabble and to avail themselves of any opportunity which might occur to show consideration towards her End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain the corpo santo the sun of africa has passed over the heavens but has not dared with one of his fierce rays to profane the sacred relics which lie out before him the mists of evening rise up and the heavy dews fall but they neither bring the poison of decay to that gracious body nor receive it thence the beasts of the wild are roaming and roaring at a distance or nigh at hand not any one of them presumes to touch her no vultures may promise themselves a morning meal from such a victim as they watch through the night upon the high crags which overlook her the stars have come out on high and they too look down upon callista as if they were funeral lights in her honour next the moon rises up to see what has been going on and edges the black hangings of the night with silver yet morning and dirge are but of formal observance when a brave champion has died for her god the world of ghosts has as little power over such an one as the world of nature no evil spirit has aught to say to her who has gone in her baptismal white before the throne no penal fire shall be her robe who has been carried in her bright flamium to the bridal chamber of the lamb 
a divine odor fills the air issuing from that senseless motionless broken frame a circle of light gleams around her brow and even when the daylight comes again it there is faintly seen her features have reassumed their former majesty but with an expression of childlike innocence and heavenly peace the thongs have drawn blood at the wrists and ankles which has run and soaked into the sand but angels received her body from the soldiers when they took it off the rack and it lies sweetly and modestly composed upon the ground passers-by stand still and gaze idlers gather round the report spreads in sicca that neither sun by day nor moon by night nor moist atmosphere nor beast of prey has power over the wonderful corpse nay that they cannot come near it without falling under some strange influence which makes them calm and grave expels bad passions and allays commotion of mind many come again and again for the mysterious and soothing effect she exerts upon them they cannot talk freely about it to each other and are seized with a sacred fear when they attempt to do so those who have merely heard their report without seeing her say that these men have been in a grove of the eumenides or have suddenly encountered the wolf the popular sensation continues and extends some say it is magical others that it is from the great gods day sinks again into evening evening becomes night the night wears out and morning is coming again it begins to dawn a glimmer is faintly spread abroad and mixing with the dark makes twilight which gradually brightens and the outlines of nature rise dimly out of the night gradually the sacred body comes to sight and as the light grows stronger around it gradually too the forms of five men emerge who had not been there the night before one is in front the rest behind with a sort of bier or litter they stand on the mountain-side of her and must have come from the country it has been a bold enterprise theirs to expose themselves to the nightly beasts and now again to the rabble and the soldiers the soldiers are at some little distance silent and watchful such of the rabble as have passed the night there have had some superstitious object in their stay they have thought to get portions of the flesh for magical purposes a finger or a tooth or some hair or a portion of her tunic or the blood-stained rope which was twisted around her wrist and ankle as the light makes her at length quite visible to the youth on the other side who stands by himself with clasped hands and tearful eyes he shrinks from the sight he turns round to his companions who are provided with a large winding-sheet or pall and with the help of one of them to the surprise of the populace he spreads it all over the body and having done this he stands again trembling just for a few seconds absorbed in his meditations praying and weeping and nerving himself for what is to follow ah poor agellius you have not risen yet to the pitch of triumph and other thoughts must be let to range through your breast other emotions must spend themselves before you are prepared simply to rejoice exult and glory in the lifeless form which lies before you you are upon a brave work but your heart is torn while you set hand to it and you linger before you begin it was in the pride of her earthly beauty and the full vigour and elevation of her mind that he last had seen her it seemed an age since that morning as if a chasm ran between the now and the then when she so fascinated him with her presence and so majestically rebuked him for bowing to that fascination yet on his memory every incident of that interview was fixed and was indelible oh why should the great creator shatter one of his most admirable works if the order of the sun and stars is adorable if the laws by which earth and sea are kept together mark the hand of supreme wisdom and power how much nobler perfection of beauty is manifested in man and of human nature itself here was the supereminent crown a soul full of gifts full of greatness full of intellect placed in an outward form 
equally surpassing in its kind and still more surpassingly excellent from its intimate union and subordination to the soul so as almost to be its simple expression yet this choicest rarest specimen of almighty skill the almighty had pitilessly shattered in order that it might inherit a higher and eternal perfection o oh, mystery of mysteries that heaven should not be possibly obtained without such grinding down and breaking up of our original nature o oh, mysterious that principle in us whatever it is and however it came there which is so antagonistic to god which has so spoilt what seems so good that all must be undone and must begin anew an enemy hath done this and knowing as much as this and no more we must leave the awful mystery to that day when all things shall be made light agellius had not been idle while these thoughts passed through his mind he has stooped down and scooped up such portions of the sand as are moistened with her blood and has committed them to a small bag which he has taken out of his bosom then without delay looking round to his attendants and signing to them with two of the party he resolutely crossed over to the other side of the corpse covering it from attack while his two assistants who were left proceeded quickly to lay hold of it they had raised it laid it on the bier and were setting off by an unusual track across the waist while agellius aspar and the third were grappling with some ruffians who had rushed upon them few however were there as yet to take part against them but their cries of alarm were bringing others up and the christians were in growing danger of being worsted and carried off when suddenly the soldiers interfered under pretence of keeping the peace they laid about them with their heavy maces and so it was the blows took effect on the heads and shoulders of the rabble with but slight injury to agellius and his companions the latter took instant advantage of the diversion and vanished out of view by the same misleading track which their comrades had already chosen if they or the party who had preceded them came within the range of sight of any goat herds upon the mountains we must suppose that angels held those heathen eyes that they should not recognize them End of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lux perpetua sanctis tuis domine. The bier and its bearers and its protectors have reached the cave in safety and pace down the gallery, preceded by its Christian hosts with lighted tapers singing psalms. They place the sacred body before the altar, and the mass begins st cyprian celebrates and after the gospel he adds a few words of his own he said that they were engaged in praising blessing and exalting the adorable grace of god which had snatched so marvellously a brand out of the furnace benedicamus patrum et filium cum sancto spiritu benedictus et laudabilis ad gloriosus at super exaltatus in secula every day doing marvels and exceeding all that seemed possible in power and love by new and still newer manifestations a greek had come to africa to embellish the shrines of heathenism to minister to the usurpation of the evil one and to strengthen the old ties which connected genius with sin and she had suddenly found salvation but yesterday a poor child of earth and to-day an inhabitant of the heavens but yesterday without god and without hope and to-day a martyr with a green palm and golden vestment worshipping before the throne but yesterday the slave of satan and spending herself on the vanities of time and to-day drinking of the never cloying torrents of bliss everlasting but yesterday one of a number a grain of a vast heap destined indiscriminately for the flame to-day one of the elect souls written from eternity in the book of life 
and predestined to glory but yesterday hungry and thirsty and restless for some object worthy an immortal spirit to-day enjoying the ineffable ecstasy of the marriage feast and the espousals of emmanuel but yesterday tossed about on a sea of opinion and to-day entranced in the vision of infallible truth and immutable sanctity and yet what was she but only one instance out of ten thousand of the almighty and all manifold grace of the redeemer and who was there of all of them there assembled from the most heroic down to the humblest beginner from the authoritative preacher down to the slave or peasant but was equally though in his own way a miracle of mercy and a vessel once of wrath if now of glory only might he and all who heard him persevere as they had begun so that if as was so probable their trial was to be like hers its issue might be like hers also st cyprian ceased and while the deacon opened the sindon for the offertory the faithful took up alternately the verses of a hymn which we here insert in a most unworthy translation the number of thine own complete sum up and make an end sift clean the chaff and house the wheat and then o lord descend descend and solve by that descent this mystery of life where good and ill together blent wage an undying strife for rivers twain are gushing still and pour a mingled flood good in the very depths of ill ill in the heart of good the last are first the first are last as angel eyes behold these from the sheep coat sternly cast those welcomed to the fold no christian home no pastor's eye no preacher's vocal zeal moved thy dear martyr to defy the prison and the wheel forth from the heathen ranks she stepped the forfeit throne to claim of christian souls who had not kept their birthright and their name grace formed her out of sinful dust she knelt a soul defiled she rose in all the faith and trust and sweetness of a child and in the freshness of that love she preached by word and deed the mysteries of the world above her new-found glorious creed and running in a little hour of life the course complete she reached the throne of endless power and sits at jesus feet her spirit there her body here make one the earth and sky we use her name we touch her bier we know her god is nigh the last sentiment of the yet unfinished hymn was receiving an answer while they sang it juba had been brought into the chapel in the hands of his brother and the exorcists since he had been under their care he had been on the whole calm and manageable with intervals of wild tempest and mad terror he spoke at times of an awful incubus weighing on his chest which he could not throw off and said he hoped that they would not think all the blasphemies he uttered were his own on this occasion he struggled most violently and shook with distress and as they brought him towards the sacred relics a thick cold dew stood upon his brow and his features shrank and collapsed he held back and exerted himself with all his might to escape foaming at the mouth and from time to time uttering loud shrieks and horrible words which disturbed though they could not interrupt the hymn his bearers persevered they brought him close to callista and made him touch her feet with his hands immediately he screamed fearfully and was sent up into the air with such force that he seemed discharged from some engine of war then he fell back upon the earth apparently lifeless the long prayer was ended the sursum corda was uttered juba raised himself from the ground 
when the words of consecration had been said he adored with the faithful after the mass his attendants came to him he was quite changed he was quiet harmless and silent the evil spirit had gone out but he was an idiot this wonderful deliverance was but the beginning of the miracles which followed the martyrdom of st callista it may be said to have been the resurrection of the church at sicca in not many months decius was killed and the persecution ceased there castus was appointed bishop and numbers began to pour into the fold the lapsed asked for peace or at least such blessings as they could have heathens sought to be received when asked for their reason they could only say that callista's history and death had affected them with constraining force and that they could not help following her steps increasing in boldness as well as numbers the christians cowed both magistrates and mob the spirit of the populace had been already broken and the continual change of masters and measures with them in the imperial government inflicted a chronic timidity on the magistracy a handsome church was soon built to which callista's body was brought and which remained till the time of the diocletian persecution juba attached himself to this church and though he could not be taught even to sweep the sacred pavement still he never was troublesome or mischievous he continued in this state for about ten years at the end of that time one morning after mass which he always attended in the church porch he suddenly went to the bishop and asked for baptism he said that callista had appeared to him and had restored to him his mind on conversing with him the holy costus found that his recovery was beyond all doubt and not knowing how long his lucid state would last he had no hesitation with such instruction as the time admitted in administering the sacred rite as juba wished after receiving it he proceeded to the tomb within which lay st callista and remained on his knees before his benefactress till nightfall not even then was he disposed to rise and so he was left there for the night next morning he was found still in the attitude of prayer but lifeless he had been taken away in his baptismal robe as to agellius if he be the bishop of that name who suffered at sicca in his old age in the persecution of diocletian we are possessed in this circumstance of a most interesting fact to terminate his history withal what makes this more likely is that this bishop is recorded to have removed the body of st callista from its original position and placed it under the high altar at which he said mass daily after his own martyrdom st agellius was placed under the high altar also end of chapter thirty six end of callista by john henry newman recording by carol pelster